sustainability. It's one big idea. It's got two words in it. Can you break it into those two words and build a definition? What's worth sustaining? Life. And if we're to sustain life, your life, my life, life on this planet, then we need to think about systems. Life is a complex set of systems. Systems nested within systems. Let's write down the college definition. The dynamic relationship of parts that make a functioning whole. I'll give you an example. Imagine I rode my bike here today, but I went over a curb and one of the spokes busted, so the wheel was a little lumpy. It wasn't quite as efficient. Because of that, it set off some vibrations in my seat. And since I'm so tall, my seat pole is kind of up there at the edge of where that little nut screws in, then it fell off. So now I don't have a seat and a lumpy wheel. And I'm going along, and it really upsets the rhythm of my gear changing. My gears break, and I am stopped. The system stops. The system's called a bicycle. So now, same thing. If I brought in here a box of bicycle parts, and I brought out a chain and a pedal, and a rubber tire, and an inner tube, and some spokes, and the handlebars, and the seat. And I said, look, here's my bike. He said, no, that is not a bike. I said, it is in potential. These are the parts of a bike, and you would agree with me. But it's not a bike. You would intuitively know that, that the system needs to function, that it is parts to whole. This is our planet. And there's several subsystems that nestle within this large ecosystem planetary boundary. The ecosystem that is our planetary bounded system has these four nested subsystems in them. One, the lithosphere, the Earth's crust, the rocks, the volcanoes, the tectonic plates, lifting up continents, earthquakes. That is the litho stone sphere, the hydrosphere, the water cycle, the ocean and its currents, the clouds, the rivers coming down, the lakes, the groundwater, the aquifers, much like the lifeblood of our planetary system, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, just the right layer, very, very thin of chemicals, particular set of chemicals that make a nice little blanket surrounding our planet that lets in just the right amount of solar radiation, holds it, keeps the temperature just about right, so that life can happen. The atmosphere. And the life we might call the biosphere, our planetary system boundaries, and the life that can emerge within these conditions. The biosphere, bio life sphere, our boundaries. In the subsystem of the biosphere, we have nested systems of different species that have developed to fill all the niches and ecosystems within our biosphere. Bacteria, insects, fish, birds, reptiles, and mammals, including us, in parentheses, in the same chart, us, the most successful of all species ever. We are the dominant species. We can think about our own thinking. We are responsible. We create fantastic systems for our own benefit. But some of our fantastic systems are putting pressure on the ecosystem boundary that is the system that provides for our success. So we need two more circles if we're to put human beings as part of the footprint here on the planet. Economic systems. Within the economic systems that human beings have created, it's based on an exchange of goods and services. It's based on supply and demand. How much do we have? Who needs it? How can we move it around? How can we show the exchange of goods and services through some kind of a symbol like money? It could be cash or credit. If it's starting to work and we have extra, we can invest. We can invest in people, places, things, factories, capital improvements, and we can own things. It works. We need to draw one more circle here. When we consider social systems, there are many subsystems, many nested systems within the boundaries of social systems. The family is the unit we expect, a mother, a father, some siblings, aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins. The tribe, I choose that word carefully because it is your community, much stronger than your actual neighborhood. Your tribe is your Facebook world. It's what sports teams you really are a fan of, what musical groups, 
It's who your friends are. Everyone has an identity as some kind of a community, virtual or physical. It is your tribal identity. It's very strong. Education, this happens in many ways. Formally, your academic education, but also your cultural education, your food choices, dress choices, language choices, and how we behave in our culture. Your religion is part of the social system because you need to believe in some moral compass that gives you guidance, whatever that is for you in your tribe. And the government system is very simple. It's just been designed so things are fair in the social system and things are safe. And the people invest in their government through taxes and the government gives back services. And if necessary, the governments make laws and we elect politicians to make those laws or to change or improve those laws. That is the social system. But notice that these three we've described in isolation of each other. That's the environment. That's the economy. This is society. Let's draw another diagram. If we're really to understand the systems of sustainability, we need to put these three together and fill in this space where three of them overlap. You know about a Venn diagram, two circles that overlap, and you can analyze the degree to which they overlap. What do they have in common? Now we have a triple Venn diagram, and we'll do the same thing, because sustainability must balance people, profit, and planet. Ecological systems, economic systems, and social systems. You can see it physically in this diagram. What goes in there? Write down five or six or seven or eight or ten things, habits, products, processes, that you know are already sustainable that fit inside that triple Venn diagram. The next diagram looks like this. Draw it carefully. Fill in the middle. There's a lot more overlap. The triple Venn diagram of sustainability, balancing ecological systems, economic systems, and social systems. Now it looks like this. If we were to put some dates on these two, this would be today. And we know there's about seven billion people on the planet. This is going to be 2050. And we know there's going to be about nine billion people on the planet. We're pretty sure of those numbers. Just from the birth rate happening right now, these trends will continue. People will have X number of children each as they mature to childbearing years, and we're going to end up with nine billion. No one's really sure if the planet can handle it. That's never happened before in the history of humanity. As we move towards nine billion, they think that's carrying capacity. Will we have enough soil to grow enough food to feed that many people? Do we have enough fish in the ocean, the major fishing stocks, to feed that many people? Do we have enough access to water that's not polluted to satisfy all the needs for drinking water and sanitation systems for that many people? And yet we know we need to more, be more sustainable, especially because of population pressure, so we'll get there. My question to you is, what's left out? By 2050, when you're my age, I'm 55 right now, when you're my age, almost exactly, 2050, what's left out of the system? In order to look at that, let's jump another generation forward. Let's go to 2100. Here's what the diagram looks like. Now you have the three circles. The year is 2100. We can imagine that as more and more people get educated about the population situation, especially poorer women in developing nations, when women get educated, they will decide how to control the number and size of their families. So this will probably go back down naturally. Birth, death, starting to balance each other. Don't know what that number will be, but it won't be this high, it will be less. And yet, what are these three circles in sequence? What's the biggest circle, the middle circle, and the smallest circle? Societies decide what kind of economic system to have. For example, the European Union decided to stop having conflicts that they fought with uh, weapons and decided to have conversations, and they could unify with one currency, the euro, 
So that group of societies, even with different languages and cultures, with a history of fighting each other in World War I, World War II, decided to, as a society, organize an economic model. Society is bigger, economic model is a subset. In the United States, society decides it's about capitalism and individualism and working hard, investment. In China, it's about central control. The economy is chosen by the social system. So as we nest these three, we need to see it in this way. And what are the practices? To be 100% sustainable here with all the circles nested, nothing left out of the system, it's going to look like this. In 2100, the practices will be related to these three subsystems. Zero net water. We will harvest all of our water from the rain. We'll reclaim our wastewater. It'll cycle back through. We'll treat it on site. Zero net water. No new pollutants going into the water. Zero net energy. If we build our buildings with a really tight envelope, any energy we produce is conserved and used. That's efficient. And where will we get the energy? 100% from renewables and no pollution as a result. Wind, solar, biomass, geothermal. Zero waste. Waste is really a dumb economic idea to have a garbage dump. It's an old-fashioned idea. It's changing rapidly. Because you want to recycle those nutrients, all of them. If we look closer at zero waste, we look at materials flow. When we think about zero waste, we should really think about radical resource productivity. Organic nutrient flow, you already know, because you compost at home and you compost in your cafeteria here, it goes back into nature. Nature does the same thing. A, a tree falls down and it rots and it turns back into soil in the forest. You understand that system, organic nutrient cycling. You'll also be participating in a new economic model that has industrial nutrient cycling, so that all the precious metals, as well as steel and iron and, and big alloys, aluminum, as well as all fibers and plastics, they will only be produced and designed into products if they can be reclaimed and put back into the industrial nutrient cycle. That's our future. How did we get there from here? And when you're my age, what will still be left out? What will be the problems to work on? One way to solve that problem is to look at a behavior over time chart. Let's try one. The vertical axis, we could say, is sustainability. The percent we are behaving sustainably from 10% up to 100%. And the horizontal axis, we might say, is time. And we might look at a unit of a generation. Every time people are about the time they're settling in post-college, maybe having a family, about every 25 years. So from today to 2025 to 2050 to 2075 to 2100. And we know we're going to be making a great deal of progress, maybe with some bumpy parts, but we're going towards 100% sustainability within this century. Then what are the leverage points? What are the tipping points, the prototypes, the projects that suggest this curve trending upwards towards 100% sustainability? Your family's home your own decision about a career is one of those circles. Your school district's choices is one of those circles. Your city government's choices is one of those circles, a whole cluster of projects around sustainability efforts. So is your state government, so is the national government. So perhaps now we can come full circle and define sustainability. Let's write down the worldwide accepted definition. All major corporations, governments from the national government to state governments to, to local city governments use this definition. Here it is. It's a beautiful phrase. It works for everybody. Meeting the needs of the current generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Whoa, there's a chorus in here. It sounds beautiful. All right, stand up. Meeting the needs of the current generation.
And now we may be seated. The football game of sustainability may start. Let the hockey game begin. Let the concert begin. If we understand sustainability, that means we understand systems and the nested systems that, when balanced, result in the ability to sustain. There are two rules to a system. Very small changes can impact the whole system. Very precise leverage points can move or improve the whole system. Small change impacts the whole system. Find the right leverage point and you can resolve or move or improve the whole system. Are you okay? You look a little bit peaked. I'm sorry, I was just noticing you. I've been watching you uh, most of the time and you've kind of flushed and kind of go red and paler and your eyes look a little dull, a little, little bit sweaty. Um, oh my gosh. Now I know a typical temperature of a human being is about 98.6, but I'm a little bit worried. See, you're just flushing here. Her temperature might be at least one degree elevated from 98.6 to 99.6. Are you all right? Yeah. How do you feel? Are you breathing okay? Yeah. Is your heart racing at all? No. I can call the nurse. No, no. I've got a cell phone here. Um, can, can we get the nurse? Yeah, we need to call the office. Are you okay? Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? How many fingers do I have up? Five. Are you all right? Yes. What is the relationship between a tiny change in the system and our whole planet? A tiny change in the system. Yeah. <laughs>